welcome everyone to the fourth Froebel uh, gathering here and it's the first time we've ever had a, a virtual gathering um, but we always have this gathering on a Saturday near Froebel's birthday which is on the 21st of April and we're usually in the Unitarian Church in Richmond but today we're all in uh, different places and I'm in my uh, dining room. Uh, my sister is thrilled that her painting is going to be viewed by so many people here on the wall behind me. Um, and, um, you know, our gatherings are not a new thing for Frobelians. Um, when I, I did some, a little piece of research and found that in 1890, Herman Bush was talking about um, Frobo teachers uh, coming together. Perhaps the people who are uh, going to uh, who are going to contribute can put their microphones off too. So, um, so the next, I'm going to read a little bit from um, Herman Posh. From time to time, Froebel would call together his colleagues, teachers, and friends, and teachers' meetings to examine and further develop his system. As in 1848 at Rudolstadt and 1851 in Liebenstein Spa. Thither would come the kindergarten teachers to interchange their knowledge, their experience, their observation, and to work diligently together and enthusiastically for several days under the eye and personal direction of the master himself. Could there be a more intensely powerful means for this propagation of his educational system? So we're um, continuing to add to that um, kind of uh, tradition um, and um, for the very first time this is going to be, um, Froebel is going to be at the forefront of um, modern technology um, and leading the way here. Um, I've been reflecting on some of his writings and um, in particular I think uh, you know the phrase come let us live with our children um, really does uh, resonate um, at this time with us. It's brought a whole new meaning to uh, living with your children because so many children, of course, are at home with their parents um, in self-isolation. Um, even some children up to the age of over 30 are now living with their parents. So it's a whole different um, family dynamic. It's also, I think, a time when we've been able to go out and um, on our daily walks really uh, see and observe nature at close quarters. And having lived in East Lothian, where I am virtually all of my life, um, I was really thrilled to see um, both the buds opening, but the other day I was really probably two metres away from a tractor that was ploughing up the field to plant potatoes. Probably the first time in my life that I've ever been so close to um, planting. So I think there's a real connection with nature that we can feel um, um, as Frobelians. So probably you would quite like to know who's here. Um, we have about 54 of us here today. So there would be somewhere in this uh, collection of people, um, staff and students from the University of Roehampton, master's students from the University of Edinburgh, a few stalwart students, ex-students of the Froebel and Childhood Practice course from Edinburgh, some local authority early years leads from Scotland, um, the Froebel Trust staff, uh, Froebel Trust Education uh, Committee, the Froebel Travelling Tutors, um, some of the um, Froebel Masterclass um, students who've gone on to become uh, the storyteller authors. And apologies if you don't apply, uh, belong to one of those groups, it's always difficult to name, um, you know, individuals. So I want, to, I want today to um, introduce you to a panel of um, people who are going to respond to um, uh, Tina's uh, new publication and then I'll introduce you to Tina. So today we have um, Alison Hawkins, um, who's the head teacher of Westercoats Nursery School. And Alison one of, was the, one of the first students that undertook the Froebel certificate um, and um, is now currently studying um, the Masters uh, in Edinburgh. She was the first nursery in Scotland to have its Frobelian ethos explicitly mentioned in an education inspection report. Up until that point, nobody had actually um, said in a report um, that um, you know, a Frobelian ethos was uh, evident throughout the uh, practice. 
Um, we also have Catherine Diamond, who is the Early Years Lead in Orkney. And uh, Catherine was the host of the first residential Frobel course um, in Orkney last summer, where we went there for a whole week um, and enjoyed, um, well, beautiful um, surroundings. Hospitality that was second to none, so um, Catherine's going to be here today. We have uh, Dr. Stella Louie, who's an early years consultant and the lead of the Froebel uh, Travelling Tutors. Um, she's lectured, tutored, trained widely across England, Scotland, Wales, and recently Australia and South Africa. And many people will know her work on schema and uh, working with um, parents. Um, we also were um, intending to welcome Lynn uh, Taylor, who was Education Officer with um, Early, Early Learning Childcare with Education Scotland, um, and one of the authors of our new um, Realising the Ambition, uh, which is our most recent national guidelines. However, um, Lynn is a lifelong learner and uh, she's currently, right at this very moment, undertaking her doctorate at the University of Strathclyde. And <laughs> She discovered she had a clash and she's had to go to her class there. So we have in her place Katrina Gill, who's eminently qualified because she is a former prompter in the theatre and a theatre director. <laughs> and she's currently head teacher of uh, Green Gables Nursery School in Edinburgh. And she's member of, she was a member of the working party and reference group for the new document, Realising and the Ambition. So welcome, Katrina. Uh, in the final section, um, we have uh, Dr. Lynn McNair, who's our host today. Um, she's head of Cowgate Under Fives in Edinburgh and a senior teaching fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Um, she is my uh, companion, my inspiration and my um, warrior spirit when I need one. Um, we are, um, you know, the joint uh, tutors. She's the course organiser for Froebel and Childhood Practice in Edinburgh. She um, contributes to the BA in the Childhood Practice. She works tirelessly, she completed her PhD, and most recently she's the pathway coordinator for the new Froebel Masters at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and finally, our last, course, our last respondent is um, Dr. Sasha Powell, who is the chief executive of Froebel Trust, um, and who's previously from um, Christchurch, Canterbury, um, she's, she was the director of Re the Research Centre for Children, Families and Communities. Um, she was the co-author of Birth to Three Matters um, and she's undertaken a whole range of uh, research in relation to babies in the ba in baby room, mother songs and daycare. Um, and she's also been the co-editor of several early years handbooks with Rutledge Sage and of course um, the Froebel Story one. So today we're going to um, make connections and, um, you know, really uh, feel part, I hope, of a whole um, unity of, of experience with, um, so we're all in our separate houses, but we can all come together uh, to share uh, something together. And we're here to celebrate, really, um, the publication of Tina's um, book here, Educating Young Children, A Lifetime Journey into a Frobelian Approach, The Selected Works of Tina Bruce. Um, this has been published in 2020, but we've really had very little opportunity to celebrate its publication and also to celebrate what a tremendous resource it's going to be um, for um, students. Um, it brings together in one place um, so many of um, Tina's writings and it's a fascinating journey into the, her development of her ideas um, across the years. So I had to go and pull out a couple of books. One is this one, Time to Play, um, which I think, uh, you know, we will use uh, an extract from this book uh, as part of our readings today. And also um, this one I've pulled out, The Exploring uh, Learner, learning the one that relates to uh, the block play project. So um, it's a really great pleasure to have um, Tina uh, with us uh, and um, to be able to have this opportunity for her to read 
and then for respondents to um, to give their um, their reflections on on her reading. So she's going to read a section, and then she's going. We're going to ask two respondents to um, give their own uh, view. Um, and we'll have three different readings with eventually six, six responders. I would just like to thank the Fredbourg Network for sending such beautiful lilies because whenever we have our gatherings we always have the lilies which is our logo and as Alison Hawkins immediately noticed several of us have got our lily brooches um, which um, uh, are just an important metaphor and I think one of the things you're going to find you, it's been something you know looking back on my earlier writings and seeing how I am now the symbolic life of the child and humans in general has always felt very important um, and that continues so it's interesting you see things which have always been important to you throughout your life and you, you didn't realize quite how important they were and I think that that does come through. So I'm going to, I'm, I've, I've chosen readings, I realise, which come fairly early actually in, um, <clears throat> in my writings. And I, 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 I can't explain why that is, except perhaps to say I've just written a book, which is with Bloomsbury at the moment, it's being published, um, which is about Frobel. So that's in a sense, perhaps <laughs> the point I've reached in the journey. Um, and I'm not quite sure whether that will be coming out now with everything that's going on um, in the world. But um, that that's, um, it's called Frederick Frobel. And it's a critical introduction to um, key themes and debates. So I don't know whether you can see that, but you can probably see um, it's got connections as the theme on the on, on the, the cover. So these writings uh, that I've selected are sort of fairly early on and the first one um, <clears throat> I, I chose because Leslie Abbott, who of course is a very eminent Frobelian and was the lead uh, person for the Birth to Three Matters um, wonderful document and uh, which has become legally part of the framework uh, in, in England, um, invited me when we had the millennium to um, contribute a chapter and I, I did, I found this, um, this is the book, it was Early, Child, Early Education Transformed and it is, um, it, she invited different people to write chapters and she said you can write it about anything that you like. So this is around the beginning of the century <clears throat> and it's called In Praise of Inspired and Inspiring Teachers. Most adults seem to remember, value, show appreciation of junior, secondary or higher education cheaters for whom they felt a fondness, values, respect and appreciation. Only a few mention their very earliest teachers. Think of Tony Blair's list of selective celebrities naming their favourite teacher or the section in the Times Educational Supplement called My Best Teacher. Why is it that most people give the recognition and the appreciation to the teachers they had in junior and secondary school but not to their nursery infant teachers? Perhaps the reasons are purely biological and it may simply be that most adults really can't remember that far back. This is not convincing because many adults do in fact remember moments and people even from their toddler times with quite a degree of accuracy. A more likely reason is that adults living in England do not place much value on the early years of education. Consequently, they don't even try to activate their memories of their first teachers who taught them. Most people are of the view that education doesn't seriously begin until the junior school years, although they seem to want to try and make younger children perform as if they were seven or eight years old, getting them to read, write, do sums as young as four years old. It seems that it is in the main those of us who in our adult lives 
work with very young children and their families who are more likely to remember with appreciation our first teachers. Perhaps our appreciation of some of our earliest teachers inspired us to work with young children and their families. I've always felt a huge rapport with Mary Rombert, who was the mother of English ballet and whose life's work has many parallels with that of early years teachers. She was made Dame Marie Rombert sometime after Dame Ninette de Valois. Dame Ninette de Valois who took the dancers and the choreography that Marie Rombert had produced, such as Sir Frederick Ashton, and she formed a new ballet company which became the Royal Ballet. Outcomes are rewarded first and not those who caused them to come about. It's important at every point of the educational system to value good teachers, not just those who are here when we ripen into achievement. Those who contributed to our education in less obvious ways, involving processes which bring long-term results are perhaps the most important of all those who teach us. I had a good childhood, happy, stimulating, creatively anchored in a loving family. My first seven years were full of doting grandparents and I attended an AMI Montessori nursery from three to five years of age. My Montessori experience began the term before my younger brother was born in 1951. The directress, Miss Smith, was a symbol of calm and provided predictable, totally secure environment. It may not have stretched my mind, but it calmed me, and I loved her. She played an important role in helping to make my brother's arrival a positive experience, and the things I could already do were celebrated, and I got very good. And I felt very good being able to walk around the circle marked out on the floor and learned to tie laces on a wooden contraption, didactic materials as I now know. Even then I preferred real life to structured artificial life. It felt good helping young children to tie their shoelaces. I knew I didn't need the wooden contraption. What was wrong with real shoes? I ran messages for Miss Smith, putting the notes for the milkman, and joy of joy, singing, dancing, acting out Fair Rosie lived in a tall tower, with my friend Stephen being a handsome prince who came riding by. When I was seven years old, my mother told me Miss Smith was very ill in hospital. I wrote her a letter in my best writing, thanking her for all she'd done. I never had a reply and later we heard that she had died. Although I was only seven years old, I, I somehow knew that by the time she would have received my letter, she would have almost certainly been too ill to register it. And even though I was young, I, I also knew that this didn't matter. I knew that she knew how I felt about her. The written word can be irrelevant, and even young children know that. If only the adults who have political power to control the curriculum of our youngest children knew that. The appreciation young children feel for the rest of their lives towards those adults who've contributed in a major way to how they feel about themselves as learners is rarely spoken. It's an abstract, intuitive thing which they take with them through their lives. And yet it anchors them forever. And it's sometimes called having a sense of well-being. After leaving Miss Smith's nursery school, I had a miserable time in a large reception class. At least I was fortunate enough to be five years old when I went to school. Nowadays, children as young as four years of age are made to experience such large reception classes. The reception class was certainly a terrible shock moving as I did from a nurturing, predictable environment with a calm adult and 10 children to a group of 35 children and one teacher. The post-war bulge was working its way through the education system and I was part of it. 
There's lots of boring lining up, copying, colouring in, having work ticked, standing in a queue at the teacher's desk before you could go out to play, which was anyway a terrifying experience and greatly to be avoided. Indeed, I quickly worked out it was better to stay in and queue than to be pinched by girls or have your skirt lifted by the older boys out in the playground. Boredom was preferable to this kind of excitement. The reception class was followed by a pedestrian year in what was then called middle infants. Nowadays I would have had to do sats at the end of this class and I would have done very badly. It was expected that children would read fluently by the age of seven or eight years. And we did. Just as children, um, just as children in the rest of Europe do nowadays. The difference was that then children were not under pressure to perform before biologically, biological development favoured it. They were not forced early as they are now. We were read to acted out stories in our play scenarios with dolls houses, farm animals, in dens that we made under tables and in the garden amongst mid pies that we patted into shape or wobbling about on bikes on our way to market or crouching behind trees, hunting animals in the rainforests or jungle as we called it, swimming under the sea playing Jacques Cousteau or on safari with lions and Elsa stories. Children throughout the world indulge in play. It comes in different quantities with variation, but it's to be found in Borneo, Nigeria, Finland, Canada, New Zealand, etc. Cross-cultural research on play suggests that far from being a privilege of white Western middle-class children, child, this group are in fact increasingly experiencing an erosion of their childhood play, especially so in the modern UK, because they are propelled into early performance of adult ways of proving themselves. At seven years of age, I moved to the top infants class to be with the verbal trained Joyce Greaves. We did radio plays, pretending to switch her desk on and off like a wireless. We decorated our handwriting books. She read us poetry and played songs on the piano. We used clay, did collage, made models, grew beans in jam jars, had a shop with lovely work cards for our maths, made patterns with wooden shapes. I now know these were Froebel's occupations. Found places on a globe and looked at artifacts and drama and we got into rather a mess when making animals out of clay. But perhaps most important, although she had 40 children in her class, we each felt we mattered to her. She had long curly hair and lovely bright coloured clothes. She never shouted at us and there was no bullying in that class. We really were a caring, learning community. Some children, I now realise, had special educational needs, but we were all expected to, and did, value, respect, and celebrate each child's achievement, and not just in the three R's. The expressive arts and experiments in science with ice and plants were very much in evidence. She visited each child at home, she made us feel we could try new difficult things because we knew that she would see us through and help us to find the courage to have a go. I've always liked fractions because of the care she took to make them manageable for me. When I was at secondary school, I heard that Miss Greaves had died suddenly. I wished I could have thanked her for all she did for us all not just for clever, privileged children, but for any child who came her way. She gave us each in our way the disposition towards learning that lasts for a lifetime, and she valued our childhood play in doing so. The junior and secondary years were barren intellectually. 
with nice teachers and less pleasant ones, but no more inspiration, no more scholarship, just academic hoops. Once you'd experienced a teacher like Joyce Greaves, you know what you're missing when it isn't there and you yearn for it. At 18 years of age, I went to the Fraubel Educational Institute, as it was then called, to train as a teacher. I was in no doubt. I wanted to be a teacher like Miss Greaves. There, I met Chris Athey, my education tutor, and Sybil Levy, my main subject tutor, with whom I studied drama. Between them, and each in entirely different ways, they stretched my mind as it had not been stretched since the Fraubel trained Miss Greaves class. That's the, that's the end of that uh, first excerpt, Jane. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. <laughs> yes, it's okay. I had, mu I had muted my own um, part. Oh, yes. that's good. Now, were you going to say a few words about that? Or were, you go were we going to pass on to the respondent? Well, um, I, rec I recognise that is the longest um, uh, excerpt that I chose. Um, it, it's important to me because I think it, 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 um, it reminds me um, of how important uh, meeting a verbal trained teacher was in the whole of my education and how much I continue to value reconnecting with that when I went to do the verbal training and I don't think I realized that I was making that reconnection when I went to the verbal training actually it's interesting um, it was just the college that I went to because um, one of my school friends said um, I think you'd enjoy this college, Tina. So I don't, I think sometimes these things are deeply inside us and we don't realise how much those early teachers or people we've met who've been significant in our lives are still influencing us. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay. So I think I'll pass over now to Alison Hawkins. Thank you, Tina. Uh, when Jane asked me last week if I would take part in this, my first response was, as long as it isn't academic and I don't have to reference anything. And although nowadays that is very important, as we have um, practitioner inquiry and so many people taking degrees and we have to research and we have to link theory with practice, it still holds a horror to me. And the horror is, I think, because of my secondary schooling experience. Very much of Tina's reading resonated greatly with me, uh, perhaps because our age, perhaps because I was fortunate enough to experience a very similar background. Uh, I think it is important, the bit that you've said and pointed out, Tina, about memory, because I do think that very young, that children can have memories from when they're very young and hopefully they are positive, but quite often they're the horror stories. Children remember when they were in hospital or children remember being bullied. But I think if we've been fortunate enough to come under the influence of uh, inspiring teachers, then a lot of that stays with us too. I do remember maybe 10 years or so ago, talking about my own practice, saying to Tina, well, actually, probably this is just a little bit old fashioned. And Tina stopped me in my tracks and she said, no, Alison, it's time honoured. And I have hung on to that. Um, and in fact, I think it gave me confidence that the work that I was doing in my own nursery actually probably was OK. If I look back to my own life, it, uh, I probably had three very important adults. One was a teacher, uh, but she was actually my aunt, and the other two were, were my parents. There were four of us, all born before I was five, and I'm the eldest, and both of my parents were involved in scouting and guiding, and my aunt actually did lecture in Frobelian 
pro approach at my house college of education so without knowing it i was seeped in an outdoor life in a life where we had time to persevere to play uninter uninterrupted uh, quite often for hours my mother in the school holidays would put us out the back door shut the door and we came in at lunchtime um, and i think as i grew older the kind of things that made up my childhood the outdoors the dens the baking the plowing around in rivers and puddles uh, gave me a resilience a love of the outdoor life but it wasn't until much later I realised that these things were all based on Fabian principles. I think the inspiration from my, let's say, nursery and primary age group years was due down to these three people. But I actually think that a lot of that was pushed to the side in my secondary years when everything was subject based. It was competitive, there was pressure, you felt yourself either better than the next person or worse than the next person. And I don't think that was good for anybody's mental well-being. And I can see now that that is raising its head again in our society today. However, I was lucky enough to go with this aunt quite often to her Saturday morning coffee mornings. And as far as I could understand, they were made up of her colleagues from Murray House Demonstration School and indeed the college. And I learned quite quickly that if I just sat there and listened, I was imbibing a lot of knowledge um, and information, some of it gossip, but actually it was the foundation for my own practice later on. So despite my poor secondary experience, as I saw it, there was a very kindly primary of seven teacher. And when I was at college myself and I looked back on that, I could see the difference was that the primary teacher had been interested in us as people. She showed compassion and kindness and allowances. But like Tina, once I actually got to college, because I always wanted to be a teacher, and in the back kitchen of our family home, my aunts had given us some desks and there are lots of family stories. Now, my brothers and sister call it bossiness, but actually I, mean, I was being a teacher and they had to sit at their desk or they had to play with the blocks. My mother had to be the head teacher and write notes and I was always teaching them. So when I got to my house, I had really found my place. I don't know if it was my vacation or what, but it was my place. I thrived on the... Um, tuition of the lecturers and then I suppose my next adult as an inspirational teacher came into my life and that was Isabel Calder and I know that Marjorie Uvery is listening today and she also knew Isabel but as her courtesy aunt. I think I only put for billion approaches and principles into the general teaching of my uh, uh, diploma there. But as I became more experienced in education, I realised that everything that I learned at Murray House under these duty were based on principles and that the approach that I wanted to use for education should always be there. Each child should matter. Each um, talent should be fostered and anybody that was struggling should be supported and there should be as little negativity as possible. So when I first started teaching I was very fortunate I had five empty classrooms in a brand new school all open plan and they linked together 17 pupils a head teacher that was petrified of infants and I had all the four and five year olds and I just set two and set out my classroom um, as I would have wanted to. I was, there was a good budget and I could have sand and water and clay and all the things that we'd want to do. And I cut my teeth with these 17 children, all of whom are now middle-aged and many of whom now still keep up with me. So Westercoats Nursery has been in existence for, this is our 31st year. And much of what I did at the beginning, I still do now. But clearly the last month, six weeks, has made all of us have to re-examine our life. And 
I think that what we have done through the inspiration of those that have gone before us is provide for our youngsters as calm a base as we can, as open-ended a base as we can. We see children as capable, we give them that opportunity. And that therefore I think, should we all in this role as educators, could we be more inspirational to a wider world? We've already started with our primary colleagues and I would like to see the methods and approaches that we use go right up through primary. But is it time now for secondary educators to step back, to look at our approaches, to remember maybe the happiest days of their own school time? Could we harness the technology that we've all had to learn in the last few weeks in a positive way? Could we bring more life skills into education? Could we stop the pressures that's on children that causes so much mental stress for them and for their families? Another thing that I find really interesting is that I've had so many responses from the parents of my own nursery, but I've also looked at the responses of staff um, where my own grandchildren are educated and, and they're in all different schools in different countries. And each of the heads is reporting back many comments from parents that I'm discovering my children. I'm enjoying being with my children. And that in a climate of real stress for many people. So is it time, please, to start valuing parental input in a better way? It doesn't mean we're not going to support those that can't do it. Could we use this horrible time to inspire parents and other educators? As Jane said at the beginning, and I had laid out that quote already, you know, let us live for our children. I think that's probably all I've got to say. I'm happy to answer oh, questions or shut up. Uh, you're, you're absolutely fine. I should have said to you that I was actually putting the 10 minute timer on and I was going to swing my little red ball when you were nearly at time, but I forgot. <laughs> well, I have no idea how long I'd let the dog for. <laughs> so uh, that will be helpful for the next people. <laughs> so thank you very much, Alison. And um, thank you for your uh, contributions to our debate. Um, Next, I would like to invite uh, Catherine Diamond um, from Orkney. And I will, Catherine, help you out by um, putting, um, you know, uh, my, swinging my little ball when you're getting your, your uh, 10 minutes. So, okay, I'll pass over to Catherine. Thanks, Jane. I don't think I'll quite get to my 10 minutes, so you're probably fine with your ball. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and thank you, um, Alison and Tina. Um, I was, when I was reading Tina's extract again, um, it was inspiring me to reflect on and revisit my own beginnings as a practitioner and what's led me, I suppose, to be the practitioner that I am, because I think that stems from our early experiences, the memories that we have, the play memories, and the memories of, of I suppose the people that have influenced us along the way and I was also really struck by Tina's reflections on her early school experiences and those warm nurturing relationships created by the people who were important to you that that comes through and I think it's relationships that are key as well in terms of our early learning and how we how we think about ourselves too but I'm probably the worst person to ask to reflect on my own experiences of education because I hated school. From the moment I got my hand stuck in my coat pocket at playgroup to the day I left school to go to teacher training college, you know, it was, it was a, a sort of a bleak time, I suppose. But I loved my early childhood and my experiences are part of my lasting memory and my family and the place we lived in were my teachers. We lived in the Lake District and every weekend my family would drive the short distance down the country lanes to a nearby lake or a forest high up on the fells. My father would disappear for the day up the fell for a well-deserved, well, slightly self-indulgent rest really. And it would leave my mother, who'd been at home all week with the children, to sit reading or painting while my sister and I played in the lake or by a stream. Every day seemed sunny and we spent hours engrossed in play with the things that we found around us. 
Fallen trees became ships or horses leaning out over the water. And we scraped clay from the banks of rivers to create little pots and made boats out of acorn shells and woven rush mats. We made dams out of pebbles and fallen sticks and we roamed up and down the slopes of the fells. My mother was there to provide the picnic when we were hungry and keep us in mind. But otherwise we created our own imaginary games, deeply connected with the beautiful and rich countryside around us. I suppose we had freedom with guidance. So when I started school at five and a half, um, I missed that reception. My mother was an infant teacher. She didn't want me to start too early and I, I've got an April birthday. So it was, you know, I waited another term. But school seemed really bleak compared to our weekend adventures. And at times it was a bit frightening. Trying to keep away from the big ball, big boys and the footballs in the concrete walled yard. And I still remember crouching at the edge of it, hoping it didn't hit me. And then later at my girls' secondary school, because England at that time still had single sex, selective education, I, I chose to do geography. And there I met Miss Cartwright. So I know this seems strange thinking about a secondary teacher, but she was quite elderly when I started my O-levels and older still when I was doing geography in my sixth year. And she was deeply eccentric but hugely passionate about her discipline. For her, geography was a hands-on practical subject, and I hadn't had that kind of experience since I was a middle infant, and she was the only teacher in secondary school that was anything like that. So she packed us into a bus, and we went out on field trips, out into the Peak District to collect rocks, to Wales to see the glaciated peaks, and to draw sketch maps of the landscape and to the local forest to dig in banks to collect soil, where there was no barrier. I remember memories of uh, crouching under a tree, trying to draw the profile of a river valley with water dripping onto the paper from my hat. So, but this was the first subject that came alive for me, exploring firsthand the materials of the world around us, just as I'd done as a child in the lakes. We often look at things without seeing. Miss Cartwright rekindled my curiosity and helped me see things as if for the first time with new and deeper understandings. I realize I've been shaped by this strong focus on first-hand learning experiences, the importance of the real and the fingering over of materials and experiences to make sense of the world. Too often we engage in learning that's too abstract as trainers and practitioners, and also when we engage with children. I've never forgotten those fieldwork techniques either, and I'm still fascinated by landscapes and how they were formed, all of which came in really handy when my daughter did advanced higher geography and her teacher went off sick for months. I know more about our local salt marsh than I ever imagined. The way we live our lives, though, tends to encourage us to move through the landscape without noticing or thinking about the how and the why. What did Miss Cartwright teach me? All my early experiences as a child with my mother. I learned to be fascinated by the everyday things around me and to see how the detail forms part of the whole. Curiosity is such a key part of what makes us good early years practitioners and curious researchers in childhood. Carita Kent and Jan Stewart suggest, if you have a child of two or three, or can borrow one. Let her give you the beginning lessons in looking. Ask the child to come from the front of the house to the back and closely observe her small journey. It will be full of pauses, circling, touching, closely picking up in order to smell, shake, taste, rub and scrape. Every object along the way will be a new discovery. It does not matter if this is familiar territory, the same house, the same rug, the same chair, to the child, this is a journey of that particular day with its special light and sound that has never been made before. So the child treats the situation with the open curiosity and attention it deserves. Kent and Stewart remind us that children see things with a freshness that adults have lost. So a few years ago, I went to visit a childminder who was about to become a partner provider. 
The children were playing outside in her garden and we sat outside to be with them. The wall of the garden was covered in a luxurious ivy and this supported a colony of snails. One of the children came over to, her, to us with a small snail cradled in her hand and we looked at it together. So often we don't have time to stop and slow down and be in relation with children. I looked at the snail through the eyes of that child and I saw things I'd never seen before. It had delicate markings along its body. The shell's patterns were shades of brown and grey and the ripple of muscles from head to tail shivered as it moved. We need to slow down and look intently at things with children. How many times do we assume that we know something because we've seen it before? We only see the whole and we don't see the details that give us the true understanding of the form. Miss Cartwright made us slow down to really see the world and not assume we knew it already. And as an earliest trainer, I've drawn on that way of being when I've worked with practitioners. So often we make assumptions about children. We feel we know them without spending time truly connecting with what is important to them and understanding their perspective without being curious. As early as practitioners, we need to create the time to slow down with children. And my early childhood helped me think about that, I suppose, reflecting back, Tina. And we need to see the world through their eyes. The richness of nature creates a context to explore and be curious together. Drawing on the early childhood memories we hold where we wallowed in play, becoming deeply involved should show us the way forward in providing the environments and experiences that children and practitioners really need. <laughs> so that's me. <laughs> well done, my goodness, that was fantastic timing <laughs> and wonderful content. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoyed um, listening to your um, whole journey and your reflections. Thank you. So now we're going to go back to Tina and she's going to do um, the second reading on play. Yes, yes. Oh, that was so lovely. I could have listened to Alison and Catherine for ages. It was lovely and full of um, so many reconnections, uh, the, the, the very early childhood experiences, but also, you know, people who matter, relationships, the nature. Um, just so many things, absolutely fantastic. Oh, I think you should both write books. Um, the next reading I chose, now this is interesting um, in terms of the, the, the time when it was written. It was 1994 it was published, so I, I suspect that I gave the talk probably sometime in 1993. It was very, um, I thought it was a marvellous idea that early education base, as we used to call it then, and um, the Institute of Education, um, where there was, um, until very recently at that time, the um, uh, Child Development um, Department, which had been set up by Susan Isaacs many years before. So very close relationships between the Institute of Education base and the, the, the Forever College. And they decided to do a series of um, seminars and I was invited to do one on play. Now I'd written my book, um, Time to Play in Early Childhood uh, in 1991. And that, that book is still um, sp special to me. I, I, I would never do a second edition of it because I felt I could not revisit some of the things that were in it again. But Time to Play was the title I gave to this, to this seminar. Um, so here we go. Um, I used to talk about universals as if they were a thoroughly good thing until I heard Michael Rosen speak on the importance of poetry. He argued persuasively that the only universal he'd found was that everyone he knows likes ice cream. Well, I have since met several people who do not like ice cream. Michael Rosen's example highlighted the difficulty of trying to tease out the universal aspects of being human wherever you live 
at whatever time in history. This thought reminded me of the inspirational talks given at the beginning of each term by the then principal of the Frubble Institute, Miss Brayley. These talks were invaluable, as was my training, which I treasure still. On one occasion, Miss Brayley talked about the importance of extracting to the essence. What is the essence of humanity? I want to know. If we look at our nearest neighbours, the chimpanzees, whom Jane Goodall has studied for years with such rigour, scientific devotion and commitment, we find that the difference lies in the use of symbols and symbolic functioning. Chimpanzees use language, which means they represent and they can use a symbolic code. In other, in symbolic code. In another experiment during the 1960s, Washoe, the captured and domesticated uh, chimpanzee, he lived with the researchers in their home, saw a duck and signed water bird. Washoe created a word using sign language, which he had been taught. Chimpanzees also play. However, there seem to be biological limits to the depth of their representational and play propensity. The limits of the individual are set by the limits of the species, according to Piaget. It seems that the human species can go deeper into symbolic functioning through the processes or mechanisms of language, notations, writing, drawing, dancing, music or culture. Howard Gardner talks of levels of symbolic functioning. Humans have the possibility through processes like play, games, representation, humour, to develop into adults who symbolically function in ways which are creative, imaginative, innovative and maybe even uh, original in the thinking that can be done. At the same time, they can use competencies that they have already developed in ways which are rigorous, cohesive and technically bravura. It's rare that adults combine both the ability to wallow in ideas, feelings and relationships with technical brilliance. Richard Feynman, Charles Darwin, Martha Graham, Leonardo da Vinci, they did, to name just a few in Western civilization. <clears throat> then I've got a little heading, shamblers and meat pins. James Willig, a social psychologist, made the remark that he has found no better way of categorizing people than to say some people are shamblers and some are neat pins. I interpret this to mean that shamblers wallow in experiences and reflect in them deeply, passionately, lovingly, agonizingly, angrily. But do they get their act together? Often not. Oh, she never filled her promise. We hear it said with brutal truth. Technically competent people, neat pin about, they keep us all neat and tidy, filling in forms, stating our aims, achieving our objectives, measuring what we learn, keeping us rigidly to our plans, totally on task. They sort us out. Or do they? Gestalt psychologists have always argued that the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. It's easy to dichotomize shamblers or neat pins, wallowers or technicians competent people, progressives, or traditional educators. Which are you? I hope that you're all of them. Dichotomies are bound to divide us, and they're not helpful. And I've got another little heading, free flow play. That's why I like the word play and continue to use it. The process of play gets rid of damaging polarizations, 
by bringing together two aspects which we need to value because they are part of being human. And they are wallow and application of technical competence that has already been developed. Play saves us from becoming total neat pins. I sometimes think adults who've not played, some of whom are quite famous and might even be considered to have done well in society, show this in their narrow, rigid approach to life. Gary Kasper said, after trouncing the most highly developed chess computer, Deep Thought, it doesn't have fantasy, intuition, or imagination. Because play is a process without a product, it's never neat pinned down to be set in concrete. It keeps moving, it's free flowing along, and it comes, goes, flows, and fades, so that we talk about the magic of childhood play. Play feeds into the processes which do require products with definite ends and outcomes. In play, we try out and wallow in different scenarios, different characters, moods, different chemistries of people, events and circumstances. We can control it or escape from it into reality, Susan Isaacs pointed out. We apply things that we've learned and understood and we reflect on them. We can draw on these ideas, feelings, relationships and techniques in creative writing, making a dance or working in a team in technology to solve a particular problem, to name but three different kinds of symbolic functioning. The wallow element of free flow play enables reflection to take place. Wallow is about metacognition, which is the awareness of our own learning and thinking. In this way, play feeds off and into representations of all kinds and enriches by its influence. Quality play helps quality representational products. I attended the International Conference on Children's Dance, Daisy, in Utah a few summers ago with our daughter who performed a solo. I joined a Jamaican workshop. We were encouraged to improvise around an idea, for example, to skip or jump. And after a while, the teacher said, let's fix it. Each of us had to decide on a little sequence and to keep it. We returned to our personal sequence at different points in the dance. It was rather like a chorus between the verses of a song. The difference was that we each had our own chorus. Everyone danced their own sequence within a pre-structured formation, for example, a line or a circle, depending on the nature of the dance and according to the time-honored traditions. No wonder dance is so central in Jamaican life. It combines play and representation in ways that are accessible and manageable to every human. And it also gives opportunity for great talent to show through. At times you free flow play as you dance. At times you fix it. You own the dance in the deepest sense and yet you link with it and the, and the culture, the, the culture's conventions and you link with symbolic systems. I've seen dance using a similar framework in different places, combining free flow play, dancing interspersed with fixing and a repeatable dance sequence. I've seen it in the streets of Cairo. Children are only fully equipped for a full adult life if they're able to wallow to metacognate ideas, feelings and relationships in synchrony and in ways which lead into sharp focusing, getting their act together, high levels of functioning. Both wallow and the ability to sharp focus and to deliver are important. Both are present in free-flowing play. 
this is a constantly developing process throughout our lives. So that's reading two, Jane. Thank you, Tina. Uh, was there anything you want to reflect on that? Or are you quite happy to? Um, just to say that when I was doing that talk, um, the, the, I developed 12 features of play, which um, I had taken from the research, but which also came from the Frobelian philosophy um, that I'd learned about at Froebel. Um, and I'd tried to articulate those 12 features in a sort of uh, the current language rather than in Frobelian language, because at that time, you would never be published in a book if you started writing books about Froebel. We really have moved on an awful long way that we can do this now. Um, so I just abstracted two of the 12 features with the wallow and the technical competence, the technical prowess, because I thought that would make a simpler presentation for the talk. But that's, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to um, invite Stella Louis um, to switch on her microphone and um, she's going to be the first responder. Hey, can you all can you all hear me? This was my first ever Tina Bruce book that I purchased. Um, yeah, Time to Play. And Tina, I still think this book is is very, very, very relevant, relevant today. I think <laughs> In, res in, in trying to respond to the paper, I think it's really important that we, we, we put the whole thing in context. Given that the paper was written in 1994, I think in 1997 we had a change of, we had a change of government, we had the Tony Blair government, where this, this paper almost seemed to serve as a way, a universal way of fighting, of fighting for play. And um, the talk kind of brings around an official rallying of people that have a similar view on play. And I think, I think, I think those things are important. But I think where the, the paper kind of falls into its own, team, you've just mentioned the features of free flow play. All 12 features of free flow play are embedded in a document which the paper fed into, and that is the curriculum guidance for the foundation stage that was developed in, I think, 2000. The first 27 pages were absolutely Frobelian. It was, yeah, those principles were embedded throughout, but from page 28 onwards, it felt slightly political it felt like there was more of a political agenda you have to go in a line this way there's no going back or going to the sides and then i think in 2002 no yeah 2002 we had um birth to three matters and both of those documents um were full of frobelian ideas and both of those documents currently make the early years foundation stage the document that we have in england yeah, it, it, it feels like lots of those um, Frobelian tenants have been, have been watered down. And, and, and the more I reflected on your paper, I found myself feeling that play is really political. Um, it's not just political, it's moral, it's about beliefs, it's about values, it's about ethics. And then I go back to what you talked about, about being universal. I'm not sure if that is necessarily a good thing. I'm not sure if that's helpful. Because if play is political, if you take play in a South African context, it's going to be very different to a, a English context in terms of what people believe, what people value, and what the political situation is. So I'm not sure how helpful thinking of it as universal is, or defining it as a universal feature is. Um, having said that, I, I, I also think about my NNEB training, which has been absolutely important in everything I do, and, and the work I'm trying to do now as the lead trainer for the travelling tutors. You know, it's clear to all of us when we try and locate ourselves in our practice that that free flow play is an essential ingredient, but that's about our personal belief. 
Um, it's clear also that for obedient adults act as a stimulus who are able in so many ways to guide children's learning to the next level, their imagination, their creativity, their, their, all their different symbolic representations. You know, we observe, we're interested, we, 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 we make suggestions and we provide opportunities for children to grow. But Having said all of that, I almost feel like I'm being romantic because sometimes when I go into settings, that's not what I see. I almost think that, you know, back in 1997, we really needed to define play. But actually, I think in 2020, we're desperately in need of defining what play means because I know in the English context, it feels very political. You know, if I read your paper, I see the role of the adult as a guide. If I look at the English document, I see the role of the adult as leading play. And I, I, I kind of think it's about other people's agendas. Um, I had a conversation with my, 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 my niece recently who has four, four children and she, she was referring to her three-year-old. And she said, Aunt Estelle, whenever I'm trying to get him to play, all he, what, what I'm, whatever I'm trying to kind of get him to do this schoolwork, all he's wanting to do is play. Um, and what she didn't seem to value was the benefits. Um, yeah, she just didn't seem to value the benefits of play. I think play is many things. And I think what this paper does is it says quite clearly that we need to find ways to look at Frobelian play. Um, and its relevance today. And Tina, there are two questions I have for you. I'm not sure if I should have questions, but there are two questions that I have for you. I think my first question is, how can we help adults to not impose the political agenda or to direct children's play in the way that they are currently doing today through legitimate documents like our curriculum and documents? And also, how can we think about play more in a universal is the wrong word um how can we think about play so that it encompasses um all different cultures rather than just one um jane are, are we all right for time if i respond to stella's questions or do you want to do that a different way Connie. Can you not hear me? I can't hear Jane. Oh, no, I can't hear Jane. <laughs> that's, that's my microphone's off. Um, oh. It's on now. Uh, yes, I mean, feel free. I mean, those are two huge questions to answer yeah. in a very short time. I don't know if you want to make a quick. Response. I'm going to be terribly quick. I think I'm getting, okay. you know, sort of sound bitey kind of responses. Um, and I mean, the, the political aspect of play is, is huge. And I, you know, I'm really interested that Stella's picked up the political climate of that um, that seminar because uh, yeah it was a rallying call for play uh, very definitely I think my my feeling about you know I'm always saying to people uh, the official documents should not lead you you should use the political documents and you can only do that when you're working with other people's children if you're trained and I, I, I don't think there'll be anybody here who doesn't know. I'm absolutely passionate about training. I'm always saying we need more training. And I would absolutely agree with Stella. What we need is verbal training, um, but then we're a very biased group. But I do believe that the Frobelians have a particular expertise in looking at play, which is a almost two centuries duration. So I, I think we're, you know, we're, okay. it's all right if we say, yes, we know about play. Um, the second question, um, I think, yes, the universal, and obviously it was dawn, dawning on me, you know, that you can't have universals. I suppose it was pre all the sort of postmodern literature that started to come in. Everybody knows I'm not great on postmodernism, but I've learned to live with it. Um, and different cultures, yes, I mean, I, I, I think this is 
you know, and the experience of going to South Africa, where we attended a wonderful seminar, and the head of the school said she was very worried about introducing play because supposing a child pretended to be a robber, they might become one. Mm. And so we we had to really think about that um, journey that uh, children might make from the literal to the abstracting of ideas and that metacognating that I was talking about, because that's a very real issue if you're living in a township in South Africa. Of course, you don't want children to play baddies because that's what they might become. So it's you know it's caused a great deal of thought. So that you know those are very quick responses to huge, hugely important questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to pass on to Katrina Gill and. Um, I think we're probably in a very fortunate uh, position in Scotland um, to have a new document that um, play is a real foundation in and I think part of that is due to um, one of the authors, um, Lynn Taylor, being uh, part of the Froebel course. So in fact there are Froebelian messages embedded throughout the whole um, document. So um, I'm going to ask now Katrina to come and um, speak on Lynn's behalf. Hello. Um, so what I'm going to try and do, Lynn has sent me um, some text and PowerPoint which I am going to now try and share with you. So hopefully people are now able to see my screen. Um, yeah, my Jane's nodding, I can see. So, um, so I'm really speaking on, on Lynn's behalf, um, which is kind of strange. Um, I had the privilege to be a, a little bit involved in this document. Um, this document builds on um, previous practice guidance we had called Building the Ambition, which um, was an excellent document and it did um, have a reference to Tina's 12 features of play, which was fantastic. But this document, uh, I think even more so, um, has really quite clearly articulated the Bolivian principles throughout it um, and a whole section on Froebel, which is lovely. Um, but what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, is about the, um, the section on play. But um, first of all, um, so Lynn had um, sent, sent me some sort of her thoughts. So she said that, you know, in, in Tina's section, she was talking about the whole idea of, of, universals, of universals and the sort of difficulty of trying to tease out the universal aspects of being human. And um, she speaks of Michael Rosen illuminating for her this kind of impossibility of applying these rules um, and Lynn says that this reminded her of two things one of them was Michael's poem um, which a poem particularly which I'm going to show for you in a minute which had really similarly inspired her um, and also the second part which is about this tricky task of being involved in producing this national practice guidance for early years in Scotland so I'm going to uh, show you this poem. Um, I don't know if all of you are aware, um, at the moment Michael is actually really unwell um, with COVID-19, so um, I think probably all of our thoughts and best wishes are with him and, and hope that he, he really does um, pull through to the, to the health again. Um, so I'm going to see if I can get this to play full screen for you and hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound. Great. Oh, before it, I start, um, so, so Lynn's asked me to ask you to think about replacing the word breathing with playing. So when Michael uses the word breathing, think about playing instead. Um, and this poem is about a strict teacher who doesn't allow children to breathe. Um, and he talks about how he and his classmates found strategies to help him through the school day. He had a teacher who was so strict you weren't allowed to breathe in her lessons. She used to stand out the front going, no breathing. And you had the whole morning to get through. <sighs> the weak ones just used to keel over and die. You'd hear them going down behind you. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And there was always a whiny kid going, meh. Come on, do some breathing. And she'd say, no, you've got all playtime to do it. And I'll go on, meh. Do you know, at the beginning of the week, there were 48 kids in my class. At the end of the week, there were only five of them left. 
Yeah. Do you know, at the end of the day, you'd be stepping over kids just to get out the room. Oh, no. There's Melanie. That's a shame. She's really nice. There's Dave. <laughs> Hard luck, Dave. Always knew you were a bit weak. Do you know, people say to me, if that's true, how come you're here to tell the tale? Fair enough, and I'll tell you. It's because when I was at school, we used to sit at desks. We didn't sit around tables like you do now. We used to sit at desks with lids. And some of us figured out what you had to do was snatch a quick breath under the desk lid when she wasn't looking. So once more, from the beginning, no breathing. The weak ones, kaboom, kaboom. The whiny one. Next, gotta go and do some breathing. No, you've got all playtime to do it. It'll go on, Nick. Don't go on. Us lot. Ah, that was the mistake. Slamming the desk lid down. If you made a noise with the desk lid, it was out. School prison. There was a school prison underneath the school hall where they used to string you up from the wall bar. Nick, I've been up here for three weeks. And there's rats. And then they blew my toenails. So I figured it out. What you had to do was put your thumb round the edge of the desk lid. So when it went down, it didn't make any noise at all. Once more, from the beginning. No breathing. The weak ones. Kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. The whiny ones. Me, go down and do some breathing. No, you've got all playtime to do it. And I'm gone, me, I'm gone. These other kids. Ouch, school prison. Miss, I've been up here for three weeks and there's rats. And then they blink my toenails, miss. Me, come around the edge of the desk. No noise at all. Survival. So I think that is Strick. a lovely way of. Um of really thinking about play and, and our kind of real need um, for play and the necessity of it. Um, and Lynn had asked us to think about um, our own school experience when we were little. You know, how does that resonate? Um, at what times, you know, did it feel that with your school experience, what Michael was talking about was, was quite similar? Um, and Lynn says that she remembers retreating into her own imagination and often being cited in their school reports as a daydreamer. And I know that there are a number of people who know Lynn quite well um, online, and she says that people that know her will know this is still to be the case. So to link into um, the bigger picture, she's really asking the question, um, how equipped are we in the education system in Scotland to be led by the child's natural urge to learn through play? Um, and in Scotland, we're making huge progress with this, um, but. Lynn obviously was part of a group that was tasked with ensuring that we had some kind of universal guidance that meets individual needs um, and starts with the child. Um, so when they were thinking about producing, realising the ambition being me, um, these were the sort of starting points um, from where they were um, coming from. I would say to you, if you haven't seen this guidance, I know there's lots of people from across um, the United Kingdom, maybe beyond, it's really worth um, having a look at it. It's a fantastic document. We feel very lucky in Scotland to have this document. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the section four, which is about the importance of play. So the pictures that you'll see are from the document. So Trevelyan principles are clearly apparent throughout being me. Um, because they're universal, um, because they're unique to each individual child, and because they start with the child, because that was the kind of leading focus for this document. Um, we know that play is universally an intrinsic part of human nature and development, but it's not simple, and Tina talked about that in, in her paper. Um, play can be, and it can mean different things for children, for adults, um, and as Della was asking that question, um, you know, of different cultures, and, and all of these aspects make play a really complex thing. Um, but through play, children start to learn to answer their own questions. They learn new skills and they learn to work collaboratively with other children and adults. And we're really lucky because our curriculum for excellence gives real prominence to play, um, particularly across the early level, 
which is um, two years of nursery and then into primary one. And um, we're also lucky that our children start primary one between the age of four and a half and five and a half. So um, they are a little bit older when they're going on to primary school. But this document is also really clearly saying to practitioners that um, the transition shouldn't be different, that primary one classrooms should look like nursery classrooms and that it needs to be the same in terms of what we're offering children that space um, to play. So one aspect of, of the guidance really is thinking about how that learning environment um, is defined and they define it as a kind of totality of interactions, experiences and spaces. So every learning environment that children have um, needs to tell a story about how play is valued. And I think, you know, we all know that if you walk into a classroom, um, a playroom, it clearly tells you um, the values of the teacher that is leading um, that, that room, setting up the, the space um, and it clearly tells children um, when I'm doing training, I often say um, to people, when you're setting up your room, start on your knees at the door and come into the space um, with the eyes of a child so that you can see what it is that you're um, you know, giving to children. Um, we have to think as well, and I think this is for me one of the real strengths of the beginning practice, that one size doesn't fit all, um, that the interactions and experiences and spaces that we're providing need to meet the individual circumstances of the settings that we have. Um, based on the children that we have, their families and their um, communities. And for me, that the Fabian principles um, really um, talk about that to us um, and speak about, about meeting children at the centre of that. And it's the whole concept of, of unity, um, I think. Um, another aspect, and this is really the last part um, that I'm going to talk about, um, is that as well as um, bringing her great um, Fabulian knowledge and um, early childhood knowledge. Lynn Taylor is also an artist. Um, so one of the things that's been really important in the creation of the document has been the look of it. So the pictures there on that slide just have gone back to our pictures drawn by Lynn and also um, this is drawn by Lynn as well. And it, she felt it was really important that it wasn't just using kind of stock types of um, images and, and things because that was part of the feel of the document. So they use, um, we use these sketch notes throughout the guidance to kind of really help us articulate processes. So this one is about exploring child-centered pedagogy and how it might look in practice. Um, and she felt it was really important to continually link this back to the child's voice. So what the child's actions, emotions, words are telling us about what they need from our interactions and the experiences and spaces that we are um, providing. And I think that concept of wallowing, and it, and it is such a great word, it really it is, um, is really encouraged in this cycle, not just for the children, but also for us as educators to wallow in that. Um, so it's really thinking about what needs to continue, what needs to be changed, and being really led by um, the child's articulation to us in their actions and their emotions and, and their words. Um, so she leaves us with a big question, which is, you know, how, how are we responsive yet intentional in progressing children's learning and development, but through that um, space of play? Um, so she says, thank you very much um, for giving her the opportunity to link Tina's work with um, realising the ambition and, and being me. Um, and she thanks it. Take care and keep safe. I will stop sharing now. Thank you very much, Katrina, for um, standing in for Lynn. And uh, we will also thank Lynn for sending that presentation, which I think just um, captured little pieces of the document that are so crucial for the rest of the uh, foundation of the whole, um, the whole of, um, idea and approach. So um, we're now going on to our third reading um, and uh, we'll be going back to Tina to, um, to uh, hear her last part, which is about um, research and practice. Um, I was just thinking, Michael Rosen is, is, is such a marvellous um, 
you know, the way he takes a, such Frobelian ideas, he used to come and talk to the students when um, I was teaching on the PGC course and, and it, you know, it, it was always just, we had such fun, but his messages were so important. This, this was um, the block play research and I have a piece of very sad news. Um, Pat Gura, who was the absolutely marvellous um, research assistant on the block play study that um, was funded by the, um, uh, the Frobel governing body um, uh, in 1989-90. In um, uh, has, has very sadly died um, and her funeral is going to be on Thursday. Um, I know that I think Marge Uva is here um, I'm hoping to to get a message about where we can send messages but if I don't hear I'm going to send them to her home address so if anybody because I understand that um, the book which she was hugely responsible for because when she, she was such a marvellous research assistant that really although my title was director I mean you know Pat was just so marvellous and I felt it was really important that she um, had had the recognition uh, with, with the book um, and um, I just thought some of you might want to send messages her son is, 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 is hoping I think that people will do that because we can't all go to the funeral um, so uh, just, just if people send me messages then I'll try and get them to her uh, to her son um, so this this comes um, obviously um, you know different people who were collaborators in the rock pay research we did it from about 19 I think it was 1988 ish and we managed to get published in 1992 which was fantastic actually people worked so hard and um, it was very very collaborative so the practitioners were uh, really you know becoming researchers and I think it is no uh, coincidence that people like Debbie Alban who was at that time a nursery nurse in one of the schools we worked with is now um, a lecturer at the University of Roehampton um, and she felt you know if you're looking for outcomes for research and impact she would be one of the examples of people who through the empowerment of that block play study became confident in herself not just as an outstanding practitioner which she already was but realizing she could be a researcher too so i this is an area of great passion for me um, so it's coming from the introduction which i wrote to to the book um, and so here we go the title is introduction doing educational research a research director's perspective. The book aims to share with busy adults working directly with children the way those participating in the Froebel Block Play project went about exploring block play in an in, as an integral part of the whole curriculum. Perhaps it will encourage other groups to develop their own collaborative projects. We've learned that collaborative research can have a very powerful influence on curriculum development. Are we researchers, practitioners or educators? <clears throat> the answer to the above question lies in the relationship between theory and practice. In effect, the Froebel Block Play project expresses in modern terms the Froebelian principle that theory and practice should be interwoven and not two separate strands. At times there can be an uneasy relationship between researchers and practitioners. Margaret Clark expresses this very clearly. It seems important to demystify research so that practitioners and students in training appreciate that research may have something to say which is relevant to education it can be couched in terms which they understand and yet can still be rigorous. Not least, they can be helped to adopt a research approach to the evaluation of their own practice. 
It's a little heading combining the roles of researchers and practitioners. The language we use reflects the way we view life. For example, the word researcher usually carries more status than practitioner. On the other hand, educator carries a different meaning. The pioneers of early childhood education are often described as educators. Froebel, Montessori, Steiner, the Macmillan sisters, Susan Isaacs, all started their own schools and worked with colleagues to try out ideas, do research, develop the practice in their everyday setting of the school community. They were all skilled at sharing their knowledge and sharing in a group and beyond to the wider community. An educator is a researcher and a practitioner combined. And there's another little heading, separating the roles of researcher and practitioner. These pioneer educators interwove theory and practice. However, during the 20th century, there emerged a gradual separation of the two. Educators began to see themselves mainly as practitioners and researchers did not necessarily have much experience of the classroom. Jonathan Sillin suggests that the growth in understanding of psychology and sociology has tended to push into the background the philosophical and principled base leading to the articulation of educational principles, which enabled the pioneer early childhood educators to tussle with the practical problems of translating principles into practice. Once educators were not, first and foremost, concerned to work from first principles and to think for themselves, they were increasingly at the mercy of those with the power to influence through research findings and theory. These would often be totally unconnected to educational philosophy and principles. Consequently, instead of being in a position to further good classroom practice, they tended to be used by it and remain vulnerable to any claims made which are said to come from research evidence, provided these appear sufficiently impressive. That's Margaret Clark saying that. A situation arose whereby assertions made about children's learning or teaching methods had to be made increasingly within the terms set by the research methodology of those disciplines. In other words, researchers were setting the agenda for early childhood education by the 1960s and 70s, and educators receded into the role of practitioners, on the whole accepting the given agenda. There is a vicious circle here. If teachers see themselves as practitioners rather than as educators, their self-esteem is affected. This, in turn, has an impact on the way teachers are regarded by others. Colin Fletcher makes the point that it is accepted by academics that mature professionals have an understanding, but it is not so often the case that their understanding is held to be equivalent to that of the academics. So, he wants to see practitioner perspectives given the same status as academic perspectives. However, he, he still doesn't quite suggest a shift of the agenda back to the days when educators combined the two roles. Recently, there's been an implicit embracing of the educator approach. The Thomas Report on Primary Education emphasizes the need for a whole school policy and for all the staff to develop shared meanings and a coherent approach. In effect, the emphasis is on the teacher as active learner and reflective practitioner, working from first principles as part of a team. And this is taking us back again to combining the roles of research and practice. Little heading, becoming educators again. The Froebel Block Play Project has emphasized the need for those taking part in it to see themselves as educators. This approach stems from a long research tradition. 
the project has encouraged participants actively to explore theory with practice in their own school and with colleagues in other schools and early year settings, building on the traditions that they've inherited through the Froebel Institute. The Froebel Block Play Project has in effect been about shifting the agenda back to the spirit of the pioneers of early childhood education, interweaving theory with practice while working with children and their families, and so rediscovering what it is to be an educator. There's a little heading, educators need a strong self-image. <clears throat> Jennifer Nias says, who and what people perceive themselves to be matters as much as what they do. The Block Play Project has been about empowering all involved, children, parents, staff in school and college. There's been subtle change in the way they see themselves since the beginning of the project. And this may be in lasting ways. The feeling of empowerment makes it possible for theory to begin to inform practice, for research evidence to be evaluated and for further areas to be studied. Last little heading, pioneer spirit. During the 18th century, Froebel developed one of the first sets of blocks for use in the early childhood curriculum, known as the gifts. As his work developed with children and parents, he moved steadily towards structuring his work with children on the basis of a strong framework for general principles. The participants in this collaborative project have continued in this tradition, using educational principles and current research literature and theory, but in the practical setting of block play in the classroom. It's hoped that this book will encourage those who work directly with young children to see the importance of taking up the educator role. Otherwise, it's only possible to receive what others consider to be good practice. Educators create good practice and because they have a sense of ownership of it, they can begin to articulate what's important in the work with children and their families and to share it. They can use research as a rich resource rather than being used by it. This book has been written by a group of educators it places the focus of early childhood education where it belongs, on the study of children in school and the development of theoretical constructs for explaining the influence of school experience. That's Zimilis. Perhaps it will encourage others to become educators, to join together and to make the early childhood curriculum move forward and so benefit the children and families they meet. Perhaps that is what is meant when we say we need pioneer spirit. That's it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tina. So um, carrying on the theme of pioneer spirit, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Lynn McNair to um, be the first uh, responder. Thank you very much and um, I'm in total agreement with uh, Tina saying that research has a very uh, powerful influence on early years. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you because I've, I've um, created a little mini presentation. Um, I, anybody that knows me knows how passionate I am about research and I have taken myself around the world. You'll be delighted to know I'm not showing you everywhere I've been, <laughs> but I've tried to pick out some of the uh, settings where I think that um, research um, was taking place. I think fundamentally, first of all, um, Tina touched on this quite a lot about the importance of being critically reflective and reflexive. The um, early years at the moment is a never changing context and we really must, um, in order to... <laughs> Davy. <laughs> is he still making the window? Yes. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> He's going upstairs, so that's good. Um, 
Um, I think fundamentally it's about the, these relationships that we're um, talking about. When Tina was talking about the importance of collaboration when we're carrying out research, these relationships are, are absolutely critical. But there's also something for me about really knowing the self. So this internal scrutiny of the, yourself when you're inside a, a research um, setting. So that's um, something that's really important. Uh, oops, just trying to, oh yeah. I, the, one of the first uh, research practice centres I went to was Mia Mia Nursery in Australia. And I was actually um, really impressed by uh, Mia Mia. The, the, nurse, the un, University Macquarie Nursery eh, <laughs> University was um, connected really closely with the nursery and they were very uh, passionate about what they were doing. They were learning from <coughs> their practice and they, they said that they were leading, they were uh, leading edge and they were innovative and I would have to agree I, I, I thought they were too. One thing that would have been helpful if we were in the gathering room in Roehampton at this time or uh, just where uh, Tina lives, the, they had three observation booths and people came and observed the children through these booths. I think we could have had a discussion about the ethical and moral um, implications of that, but they did have a lot of interest of people. They argued that it was because um, they didn't want to disturb the children's play, but there's something for me about children not knowing that um, people are there, but you know, that's something else to consider. They had lots of visitors and they, one thing that I would really like to do, because anybody that knows me knows I'm very keen to have a research practice centre um, built. Um, and I would like to think that, you know, we not only would absorb policy, but we would also influence policy. And certainly at the Mia Mia nursery connected to Macquarie, they did um, influence policy. Davy looks like he's going to saw again. Are you Davy? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> then I went, oh he is, he is. I can't Davy, could you not saw just now, please? Could you just saw just now? <laughs> could you not saw just now? He's got his headphones on. <laughs> seconds, I can't believe it. Um I went to New Zealand and Again, uh, totally, utterly impressed by uh, what happened at New Zealand. At first, I couldn't put my finger on it. Davy, two seconds. Um, I couldn't put my finger on um, what it was that I was really impressed by. And uh, it, it was really that, just what Tina was saying, what happened with the uh, block play project was that um, the practitioners could all articulate what, why they were doing what they were doing. And I, it turns out that they, they'd all carried out individual pieces of research and they, could, they were so passionate about it. And one of the um, nurseries, well they had 30 I think nurseries, the child space nurseries, they were um, private but they had a beautiful uh, training uh, space for to teach people, uh, to teach practitioners and they talked about refueling, inspiring and stimulating them and um, I definitely got the impression that uh, that's what they were doing. I went to Reykjavik and although I couldn't um, see some of the uh, research practice centres if they even exist in um, Iceland, but the one thing that happened throughout all the settings that I visited, there was a definite commitment to continued professional development and action research. And Tina was just talking about the importance of um, owning your research and um, and this is certainly something that I gathered from the practitioners who'd carried out small pieces of action research. They had this sense of ownership, which meant they could talk you through it and tell you the whole story about it. And I thought this was really important. I, I did travel to Finland and um, Finland is kind of um, highlighted here as, a, a, as leading a practice, but 
you know, and any of my visits were only snapshots at any time. But the, the nurseries I visited in Finland, I, I started getting, this is where I started thinking, we actually have easily these, uh, you know, really good environments at home. And I think it was time for us um, in Scotland and in England and the rest of the UK to really celebrate our own practice um, through doing research within it. We're all very familiar with uh, Reggio Emilia and, you know, I've visited there a few times. And for me, um, the, the most um, sort of thing that I think is coming out of Reggio at the moment is the emphasis on educators as professionals and their um, autonomy to innovate. They have a new um, international centre built and it's got a, a huge shop for buying lots of resources and um, but I think that it, there's things to take out of that out of Reggio Emilia as well and I think one of the things about traveling around the world is you realize what you would like and what you wouldn't like in uh, different settings and that's a good thing as a researcher. The other place that we went to, um, we did some research with uh, Bulgarian um, colleagues and we eventually set up, and, and it took a long time because of the controlling measures over children in Bulgaria, to set up a Frobelian setting there and uh, it was absolutely lovely at the end of the day. And it, the there was a real uh, commitment and passion um, on self-assessment and reflection and um, they'd set up in this, we designed this um, nursery that's, as I say, it's absolutely beautiful and there was a real commitment and passion from these practitioners and they'd set up this lovely um, research room and I, I just thought the work there is just going to keep advancing so I'm, I'm really pleased with that. We, um, for the International Frobo Society conference two years ago, a small group of us went to um, Hiroshima and we visited a nursery called uh, Gaines. And again, there was links to the, the local university and they were talking to us about the opportunities, the important opportunities to meet and discuss research and support um, systematic and uh, self-reflection. The other uh, key thing was there were students um, training and learning in the setting and there was this real willingness to um, exercise their professional judgment and carry out research. That for me, um, Gaines was really impressive in the way that they really involved parents from the outset. They had a big room that was set up that where parents and children could play long before they made a decision about whether to go to the nursery or not. And when you were, we were leaving, there was a this little um, the, the picture down at the bottom was where parents actually worked to develop resources. So they were very, very much included in the community. So it was such a learning community where um, this research was informing practice, but there was this real fusion between theory, policy and practice. Um, I was invited to go to um, Greece to do some work. They, they were really interested in um, Froebel's work and this work's going to actually continue should we be successful with our um, recent hub and spoke application. We hope to do um, work with this group of people. The very interesting thing and why I've put the slide in is that it, the, the uh, places we visited, the um, practitioners did not um, necessarily um, articulate what they were doing. They, they were really kind of controlled and it really helped me compare the difference between settings where um, research forms a great part of what you're doing in practice or whether or not it, it all comes from top down. I recently visited Penn Green, um, which is always highlighted as one of the best research centres. Um, and again, I think I would have to say quite openly that I um, there were some aspects of it that I thought were useful, but overall I know what I wouldn't like in a, a research practice centre. My, my final slide is about CREC. Um, I visited there just recently in recent months and I was extremely impressed with what was happening there. The practitioners were um, really informed by research. Uh, Tony and Chris, uh, 
really include the practitioners in the work and also not only that they work alongside them so there's a constant learning and one thing that I would take from all my visits is that when research happens in practice you it is obviously um, hugely beneficial to the children but you actually see really um, professional articulate um, practitioners who um, are able to evaluate and discuss their practice in a very useful way and uh, you know so I think it's really good for their confidence and their ability to um, self-reflect and as Tina was talking about in the block play project they were um, there's all this collaboration that goes on and I also think about the importance of um, you know we we all support children's interests and that final slide that um katrina put up talked about um, a child-centered kind of education of course practitioners when they're really interested in something will put their heart and soul into it and that's why we developed our um, cpd course to include um, a development project and uh, you know because the research is really useful to um, not only to the practitioner doing it and of course to the children but also to other other um, members of the team thank you very much for listening over to you Jane thank you um, I'm back on mic not but ready this time okay um, we're doing really well um we have um one responder left thank you very much lynn and thank you for your slides um and our final responder today is um sasha powell from um the frobo trust so sasha would you like to switch on your mic uh hopefully it's on can you hear me hello yes great hello hi tina hi everybody <laughs> what a wonderful afternoon um i uh i've was inspired in so many ways and touched in so many ways by all the readings that um, Tina has, has shared with us this afternoon and the responses. But the reading uh, about research and practice that I was asked to talk about, um, uh, three ideas in particular jumped out at me, or rather I pulled out, let's say, three ideas and interpreted those from what Tina had written. And I just want to talk briefly about each of those three ideas and the kinds of questions that uh, those ideas led to for me. I'm not going to answer those questions, I just want to share them with you really. Um, so the first idea is about collaboration. Um, and Tina has said that collaborative research can have a very powerful influence on curriculum development. So if collaboration in research is important, who can or should be involved? Why? And what role might each person play? So what does collaboration mean in research? The second idea that I want to pick up is this issue of uh, disconnection. If the, the title researcher carries more uh, status sometimes than practitioner, such that practice has become less influential in some circles than research evidence or even data. Even if that research and the data are disconnected from the realities of practice and if philosophies and principles of practice have become distanced from both research and in some cases practice, might it follow that educators who research can help us to attain a higher status for practice and for the profession more generally? And can the gap between philosophy, research and practice be narrowed or eradicated within and beyond the context of early childhood education? And I'm basically implying in policy. Um, the third point I just wanted, or idea that I wanted to, to uh, share with you was about identity and self-image. And if self-image determines educational practices, what is it that contributes to one's identity? Can it change? And if so, how? 
Um, in my years working in research and in my current role, I've come up against these themes of collaboration, disconnection and identity many times. Um, for example, on collaboration, many years ago I was involved in a study of educational support for children who'd been described as having speech, language and communication needs. Uh, Multi-professional and interagency working in that study came out as a recurrent theme. It was described in systemic terms as inherently necessary. Within a system that existed, no one person or agency was thought able to support a child effectively on their own because each had their own discrete remit expertise, but have also a part to play. And in operational terms, working together was described as invariably problematic, perhaps because of organisational jargon, cultures, resources, priorities, and sometimes a fear of becoming seen as a generalist instead of a specialist. Collaboration and power, or power dynamics within professional relationships, were central concepts in this particular uh, piece of analysis. I just want to attempt, if I can work the technology, to share a picture with you. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, oh, it's word. Um, at the time of this study, um, it was theorised that the pinnacle of working together was something called integration. I don't know if you can see that, it's the, the yellow bit on the top of the pyramid. Uh, but it was said that at that time, a lot of work was characterised by communication at the bottom, in which different professionals or agencies focused their efforts on explaining what they did and didn't do to one another. Efforts to achieve anything other than communication were usually marred by differences or perceived differences in power and the locus of control in what was meant to be collaborative working. Importantly, the systems in which they worked were inhibiting many of these professionals who were trying really hard to achieve what might have been described as integration. Um, so in an attempt to answer a question that was not dissimilar to the one I asked about whether educators who, uh, beg your pardon, I've gone skipped on too far. The second idea I'd like to mention is disconnection and especially the idea that educators have been pushed away from first principles in favour of unconnected research findings and atomistic theory. In a book about philosophies and theories of early childhood education, which I had the pleasure to edit with Tricia David and Cathy Gooch, we talked in our introductory chapter um, about philosophy uh, of education being removed from teacher education in the 1980s because the government at the time believed that teachers didn't need to know about philosophy. In our chapter we argued that philosophy not only helps us to think about how to work with young children but also how we live as adults who are educators and that theories must cause us to stop and reflect if we use them because they have often chopped up aspects of children's lives into separate little pieces, even though they are clearly synergistic and development is holistic. In an attempt to answer a question that was not dissimilar to the one I asked about whether educators who research will gain a higher status for their practice, um, I worked in 2016 with three groups of wonderful infant toddler teachers in America all of whom were active researchers. In all cases, their research was absolutely central to their professional being. It enriched their work with babies and families, and it gave them kudos among their peers. Sadly, it did nothing whatsoever to help raise the status of their work in the wider community. And this seemed to be largely because of entrenched social attitudes and misunderstandings of the complexities involved in the work of infant toddler teachers and perhaps partly because they were quite isolated and in the main not connected to others or involved in what might be described 
as critical action or activism. And so this leads me on to the third idea that came to mind from uh, Tina's reading, which is identity and self-image. When Kathy and I started the Baby Room Project in 2008, uh, we, were invite we invited about 40 young women who work with babies and toddlers in nurseries to share their experiences with one another and with us. One of the fir first things we noticed was how they described themselves and we wrote about this in an article for OMEP, which was called The Lowest of the Low. That was a quote. Tina has mentioned Jennifer Nias's words, who and what people perceive themselves to be matters as much as what they do. The Baby Room Project participants' opinions of their status also influenced what they believed they ought to do and their for how they described what they did. These descriptions were concerned with functional tasks and following prescribed routines. Through dialogue with one another, they began to notice that their work was simultaneously physical, emotional, and intellectual. They began to feel differently about their self-image and identity and to feel energized to challenge this so-called lowest of the low status. They documented and presented filmed examples of their work and together they reflected on their roles more confidently and with greater abstraction and debate. Kathy Gooch and I were reminded of Paolo Freire's concept, I'm going to struggle to pronounce this but I'll do my best, <laughs> of conscientização. If anybody speaks Portuguese I apologise. Um, and this comprises both reflection and action designed to transform social systems and conditions. Like Freire, we felt that the first step was a kind of critical literacy involving reading written words and reading the world. Dialogic opportunities with others with similar experiences helped all of us to develop greater critical consciousness and a sense of what might be called oppression or lack of status was both a process and a state of mind. Stella has just suggested that play is political. Peter Moss once argued that education is political and indeed Kathy Nutbrown has said that all research is political. Froebel recognised that what happens inside the kindergarten is always connected to the wider world. Robin Alexander and Joe Tobin have argued that pedagogy is inextricably linked to and reflects cultures. And I take from these educators an implication that educational research should start from a position of critical consciousness and critical literacy, so that it's connected and situated within the wider socio-political context in which educators and children are living, teaching and learning. Consciousness can lead to a will and belief in the capacity to make changes beyond one's immediate context for oneself and others through critical action in community participation, just like today's event. If integration is a more equal form of working together, then power is an important consideration in a society that's privileged or even perhaps reified particular forms of knowledge and ways of knowing and by association has created a hierarchy of representations of that knowledge. And so I think that relational empowerment, ensuring that everyone is helped and helps others, should be central to research endeavors. In relational empowerment, there's solidarity and reciprocity, which rely on everyone articulating philosophies and theories that contribute to individual identities and collective self-image as a group. Finally, connecting to what others have said so much more articulately than me today, I just want to finish by saying that for me, inspirational mentors, curiosity, uh, creativity, free flow methods of data construction, wallowing in analytical processes, feeling like there's space to breathe in research without fear of ridicule, perhaps it's what Lynn called the uh, autonomy to innovate, are all valuable aspects of educational research. Thank you. <laughs> That's me finished. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, and actually, you managed to bring a whole load of all of our different messages together in that final um, presentation. So thank you so much. I think um, if we go away today feeling um, that we've got a lot of questions to ask both ourselves and um, maybe the people that we work with um, and beyond that into um, any political spheres, then we've had a very um, productive afternoon. I hope that you've had a really enjoyable afternoon, um, you know, feeling connected to something that's beyond your small um, living space just now, um, that you feel that you, there are people out there in the world who think the same way um, as you do um, and you feel part of that um, whole. I think um, to finish I would like to ask you um, to um, pop on your cameras again. Please don't put on your microphones, <laughs> just your cameras and um, we'll do um, some waving and thanking uh, people. <laughs> so. Trees are green, <laughs> red roses too. I see them blue from in you, and I think to myself, What a wonderful. <laughs>